You can count when you're happy. One, two, three, four. You can count when you're sad. One, two, three, four, five. Or count when you're frightened. One, two, three, four, five, six. Count when you're mad. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Ah, counting is wonderful. Counting is marvelous. Counting's terrific. And how? Right from the teaser, it feels like we've been transported back to first season, returning to the traditional Crypto Freak formula. Clark is competing in a swimming match at school, and there are two kids we're focusing on we've never seen before, a boy and a girl who are dating, and this girl, Chrissy, is saying seemingly random and vaguely ominous things like, these are the best times of our lives outside of any real context. Pretty sure one of these kids is going to get killed right before the intro. Yep. That's what I thought. Turns out Chrissy is actually nearly a century old and has the power, for reasons we're not told, to suck the youth out of people to keep herself young. Smallville sure likes these eternal youth episodes. By my count, this is the third time somebody has either had the power to stay young or else that was a happy side effect of some other power. Anyway, while Chrissy is trying to stay in high school because she thinks there's nothing in life after 18 but pain and misery, we're treated to two other subplots about characters who have long since been out of high school and whose lives are filled with pain and misery. The whole episode centers on the theme of the past coming back to haunt us. Jonathan and Martha are strapped for cash, as always, even with Martha's new job working for Lionel Luther. And man, if they're still struggling on Martha's new salary as Lionel Luther's personal assistant, I have no idea how they avoided foreclosing on their farm before she got that job. So, Martha asks her father for financial help behind Jonathan's back because he and Jonathan don't get along. Clark has never been allowed to know his grandfather because of the bad blood between the two men, and because Jonathan and Martha can't trust him with Clark's secret. But Clark is naturally curious about his grandfather and wants a relationship with him. So he presses his father for the story of what happened between the two. We find out that Martha's father wanted her to be a lawyer like him and didn't think a farmer was worthy of her. So when he refused to support their plans to marry, Jonathan punched him out. So Clark spends most of the episode trying to play peacemaker between the two men to no avail and continues to work toward a relationship with his grandfather despite the problems he has with Jonathan. Meanwhile, Reynolds, the former principal of the Excelsior Prep School, where Lex went, becomes the principal of Smallville High, and immediately starts honing in on Clark for associating with Lex. Reynolds' career was ruined by Lionel Luther after an incident that got Clark expelled. An incident, if I'm not mistaken, that's fleshed out in flashbacks in Season 7. And he has a similar view of Lex to Jonathan's. He's a Luther, and he was raised by a man who only sees people as a means to an end, and as far as he can tell, Lex is no different. But Reynolds isn't unreasonable in his expectations of Clark, even though though his interest in him certainly begin due to a personal vendetta. He calls Clark out on everything I've complained about in previous reviews. A la Strickland and Back to the Future, he calls him a slacker. He says he doesn't have any goals or clear interests, no extracurriculars besides typing up cafeteria menus for the torch, and he's not very proactive. I love this guy! Somebody give him his own spin-off, where he just goes around giving kids homework assignments and forces them to give a crap about their future. I'd watch that! He assigns Clark a paper on where he's going to be five years from now in an attempt to give him some direction, which he oh so desperately needs. Sure, he's picking on Clark out of contempt for the Luthers, but ultimately what he's doing is actually really positive for Clark's future. Of course, Clark has no idea where he'll be in five years, and the best he can come up with when he first talks to Reynolds is, I want to help people. By the end, Clark has written the paper and tells Lana that in five years he suspects he'll be in college studying journalism. Fortunately, DVD box sets allow us to see into the future. Uh, five years from now, he's actually dropped out of college, is chasing down aliens he let out of the Phantom Zone, is now mortal enemies with Lex, and Lex is dating the girl of his dreams. Uh, nice try, Clark. You were really close. Lana also has a past coming back to haunt you subplot, where she finds a picture in storage of her mother hanging all over some guy who's not Lana's father. The picture was taken while her parents were briefly split up a year before she was born, so the episode ends with Lana in very soap opera fashion, announcing to Clark that her father might still be alive. Gasp, shock, and awe! Could it be that we're once again frantically groping around for something for this character to do? Clark and Lana look at each other dumbfounded, each holding an artifact related to their past that will inform their futures, then credits. 
This is overall a really well-crafted story. For what initially seems like a standard, uninspired, and kind of retreaded cryptofreak plot, Chrissy is left way in the background through most of the episode and serves as the physical embodiment of the consequences to living in the past as a lot of our characters are doing. We don't follow her to the point of wondering if our main characters are even supposed to be the protagonists of the story, and their stories don't just loosely relate to the cryptofreak plot like we've seen in some other episodes. I also think it's cool that her obsession is the opposite of most high school bad guys, who think high school is torture and would kill anyone to get out. It's a very dense episode and everything's pretty well organized. All these different subplots weave in and out of each other rather than all being in the same show and again only loosely tied together by a theme. What weaves these all together are the consequences of people's past that affect different characters. Clark is caught in the middle of Lex and Principal Reynolds' conflict. Clark is also affected by Jonathan's feud with Martha's father. And Lana Clark and Lex are all affected by mistakes their parents made. We've got more great paralleling going on with the Kent and Luther families, and this time it's done in a nicely subtle way, and you might even miss it on first viewing. Clark and Lex are both dealing with the fallout of something their fathers did, with Clark's grandfather and Principal Reynolds' respect. Clark is trying to prove to his grandfather that, as he says, his family is about more than old arguments and overdue bills. Lex is trying to prove to Reynolds, who he respects and looks up to, that he's not the same as his father by, in his mind, nobly telling Reynolds not to take his antagonism against Lex out on Clark. Of course, he offers the school Luther Corp's old computers on this condition, and that proves to Reynolds quite the opposite, as it was a deal like that with Lionel Luther that got Reynolds fired from Excelsior in the first place. To Clark's grandfather and to Principal Reynolds, nothing has changed, and so their views remain the same, and both Clark and Lex fail in their attempts to change the future by resolving the past. But let's compare these two pasts. Jonathan made an enemy while trying to do what he thought was the honorable thing, though he made a mistake in punching Martha his father, which is consistent with his well-established temper. He tried to ask Martha's father for his permission in marrying his daughter, the traditional and responsible thing in his eyes, and he was rejected because of his income level and nothing else. Lionel made an enemy for quite the opposite reason, not on a matter of honor, but in a cover-up, getting rid of Reynolds for trying to expel Lex by bribing the prep school with a new library. I think it's also interesting that both situations involve money. Jonathan's enemy was made because he didn't have enough, and Lionel's was made because he did something sinister with his wealth. These pasts inform who these two people are now and the way their sons are now dealing with these problems. Clark tries to resolve the situation with his grandfather by attempting to build a positive relationship and breaking down the barriers between them while Lex tries to resolve the situation with Reynolds through a bribe. Again, they both fail, but for different reasons. Clark fails because his grandfather is too stubborn to listen. This is, by the way, one of the only times I thought a walking away while angry scene was actually really effective. Every time Clark tries to make a connection with his grandfather, he just looks at Clark like he's trying to explain a video game to the old man. He's not even trying, and after trying to have a conversation with him over and over again, I think Clark is justified and makes a real statement to the man when and he finally just gives up and closes the door behind him. Clark fails through no fault of his own. Lex fails because he proves Reynolds' point. Reynolds, who turns a negative into a positive when he, at first, seems to go after Clark just because he's mad at Lex and uses that anger to try to be Clark's mentor and to help him not go down the dark path he feels Lex is headed down. Reynolds may have been willing to be proved wrong, but Lex didn't pass the test. I love the moment when Lex says, in a way, you're responsible for the man I am today, and Reynolds responds with, I'm not sure that's a burden I want to take on. Neither of these pasts is really resolved, and that's because they can't be. Someone is still living in the past and blocking the future from being paved. This is all really good stuff. And obviously, I love it anytime Clark is this proactive. In an episode about how Clark hasn't been very proactive to boot, this Reynolds guy is a godsend. Man, I hate to say I'm glad Quan died, but that guy was a bum. If Reynolds hadn't taken out his hatred of the Luthers on Clark, it may have never even occurred to Clark to aspire to be a journalist, as apathetic and reactionary as he's been so far. But isn't this kind of a sad statement of the modern teenager, that Clark's biggest battle so far seems to be coming up with any shred of personal ambition whatsoever. I mean, sure, he's just a sophomore in high school. Not everybody has got their life goals all figured out by then, and a lot of people need mentors to give them a push in a more proactive direction. But his best friend is freaking Lex Luthor. His friend Chloe, a high school newspaper reporter, is the only person in town reporting the actual news when it comes to crypto freaks and media rocks, and this would-be girlfriend runs her own coffee shop. You'd think some of that might rub off on 
on Clark, just a little, and it takes the school principal making him write an essay before he finally says, maybe I actually like journalism. I am glad this is planted early in the second season, though, and only wish it had been used as a springboard to turn Clark into more of a go-getter and start more actively pursuing stories and working on his writing like Chloe does. Honestly, the biggest problem with this episode is that it doesn't inform the rest of the series more than it does. Reynolds feels like the introduction of a major recurring character, one I'd like to see crop up from time to time, and we never see him on screen again. Of the three big subplots here, each of which could have been continued on in later episodes, the only one the show really picks up on again is the guy who might be Lana's real father. So, you know, the one I had the least interest in. There's a whole bunch of lazy with this Crypto Freak, and it's kind of okay since she's so far in the background. But when you really think about it, she's not very well thought out at all. First off, she's not really a Crypto Freak. The meteor shower was put there at the beginning of the series, so we'd have an explanation for this formula of a new superpower bad guy every week, right? But what if you want a Crypto Freak who's been around for decades and feeds on people's youth? She couldn't have gotten her power in the meteor shower, because that was in 1989. So what do you do? You just... I guess, don't do anything at all. You just have Clark and Chloe so used to weird things in Smallville that they don't even question it, and you give no explanation. And then there's the glaring problem that if she's gotten away with this for so many years, what's so special about Clark and Chloe and their investigative talents that she stopped now? You have to have them do something really clever or figure something out that nobody else could have before, or you run the risk of Chrissy getting stopped this time just because she's in the town that has its name in the title, which is pretty much why she gets killed, really. Her powers have nothing to do with being in Smallville, so the only reason Clark and Chloe know these kids' deaths aren't just extreme cases of pageria, the only explanation baffled doctors can come up with, is because they've dealt with crypto freaks. But really, any idiot with half Aunt Nell's brain could see that two pageria deaths in two days is suspicious. So, Chloe looks back at old records and finds triple pageria cases dating back to the 1920s, and finds an unaged Chrissy using different aliases in yearbooks around each incident. I'm assuming the idea is supposed to be that nobody investigated because people can't deal with the far-fetched idea of a girl with superpowers, but I'm sorry, that's stupid. Whatever the case would be, that's pretty freaking suspicious, don't you think? Three people rapidly aging to their death in a matter of seconds in the same place? I mean, if you're not thinking a person is behind it, aren't you at least worried about an epidemic and quarantining the place? When two of these happen at Smallville High, all the principal things about doing is shutting down the Spirit Week festival, and Chloe says he obviously hasn't had his weird meter reset for Smallville. How are the coroner and local health departments not freaking out about stuff like this? It, whatever. It's Smallville. We've seen weirder deaths. But there's no way an investigator wouldn't have looked into these suspicious deaths and matched Chrissy as being around every time it happened in different places. And how does Clark beat Chrissy at the end? He throws her through a big poster and stands there while she rapidly ages to death. So basically, he has nothing to do with stopping her at all. Really, I think he's just there because Clark fighting the Crypto Freak at the end is part of the usual formula. Like, we're so used to seeing this, we won't even notice that Chrissy still would have aged to death had he not even shown up. He didn't save Principal Reynolds. I guess Chrissy did something to him when he found her at the Talon, but he's not there when Clark shows up, and we're not told what she even does to him by the end, just that he's at the hospital and and he's fine. And she obviously didn't suck the youth out of him. He's older, so I don't know that that would have even helped her. And if she had, he'd be dead right away. And why couldn't Chrissy find somebody to suck the youth out of before Reynolds got there? I don't get it. The villain in this one actually beats herself because it's time for the episode to wrap up and nobody thought this one out. I appreciate what she represents thematically, but the story would have been a lot better without her, I think. She's the one really, really weak link. Like last episode, I do feel like the theme is a little in our face. We've got literary references for every subplot, and the phrase, the past coming back to haunt, is used at least a couple of times. The references aren't bad, but I think Pandora's box is a little obvious, which Lex evokes when Lana is talking to him about the picture she found. Retroactively, it's kind of odd, because with the New 52, Pandora and her box have actually become part of DC's mythos. And questions to ask Jarrell when I get to heaven. Okay. This is going to be the smallest, most nitpicky thing I've ever brought up. But really, what is an MP3 in the Smallville universe? No, I'm serious. Toward the end, at the Talon, Pete says that if the band doesn't show up, all they're going to have is a half dozen MP3s in Pete's boombox. Um, what? 
somebody either doesn't know what an MP3 is or what half dozen means. So Pete has six MP3s. I know it's 2002 here, but really, six? Your average CD has like 10 to 12 tracks. Six MP3s? And how are you transporting them? On a CD? We don't have iPods yet, and I don't think flash drives were real common yet either. And if he's just got MP3 files, how is he going to play them in his boombox? This episode was co-written by Garrett Lerner and Russell Friend. One of these guys is trying to sound hip and has no idea what he's talking about. And now let's get to the scoreboard. Well, we've got our first non-Cryptofreak, characters who have superpowers but definitely didn't get them through Kryptonite, and that's Chrissy. She's got the power to turn other people old and keep herself young, and her bad guy motivation is be aggressive, be, be aggressive, woo! Uh, we've got one character walking away angry, that's Clark when he tells his grandfather, I don't see how a man who hasn't seen his family in 20 years can just walk away. We've got one rude super speed exit, that's after Clark and Chloe piece together that Missy is feeding off people's youth. We've got one bad guy death, of course, and we've got one instance of Clark and Lana in the loft. I'm gonna give Redox a 3 out of 4. More great family feuds and politics, but a really weak sorta crypt the freak drags it down. Was there anything I missed in any category? Leave me a personal message on Geekvolution, and I'll be happy to add it to the count. I'm Captain Logan, and consider this episode counted.